Hey guys, um, I'm going to pick up where we left off on Friday with paragraph 7. So you should have open the um, Frederick Douglass speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. And I am going to go ahead and read and we're going to continue to annotate, okay? So we left off with paragraph 7 where it's talking about the slaveholders, okay? So here we go. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it is the enactment of the laws for the government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death. While only two of the same crimes with the subject will subject a white man to the like punishment. So let's stop for a second here. Okay, so we should be noting that there are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia that if a black man commits them, then what's going to happen? If a black man commits a crime... then they're going to die, okay? But what happens if a white man is guilty of the same crime? If a white man is guilty of the same crime, It does not equal death, okay? So there are specific different differences between the penalties for a white man and a pen penalties for a black man. Right there, the law states it, okay? So I'm starting right here. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is moral intellectual and responsible being okay so we're proving that that these slaves are human being so then it says the manhood of the slave is conceded it is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read or write. So it's prohibited. You're not allowed to teach a slave to read or to write, okay? But if a slave is not a human, then why does it matter if they know how to read or write? So this is, again, more proof that slaves are human beings. If only I could type. When can you point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls in the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. So then he goes on to say that all of these animals, all of these things were created, again, right? Who created them? Think for a minute. These are Christian people, right? So they believe that God had a part in creation, okay? So God had a part in creation, but all of these animals can't tell the difference between black or white, okay? And why?
can't the animals tell the difference? What is Frederick Douglass saying? There is no difference between black and white, okay? All right, paragraph eight. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro re race. It is not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metal, in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, ciphering is like deciphering, figuring out what words and sentences mean, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Oh boy. So what does this mean? They have to prove these black people have to prove that they are human beings. After everything that's in the, after all of the things that he lists, they still have to prove themselves. It's not good enough. Nothing is good enough, okay? And I'm going to write, it, it, is, it isn't even enough to follow the word of God. They still have to prove themselves, okay? No matter what it is. So here we go. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? How should I look today in the presence of Americans dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom? Speaking of its relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively. To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. So he's saying that it's an insult if he has to point this out to them, okay? The Bible says it's wrong, yet you're still doing it, okay? That's what this is. The Bible says, under the canopy of heaven, the Bible says slavery is wrong. But they are still allowing it to happen. And remember, we talked about this, that he is in the north. So it doesn't really matter that these people are not slaveholders. He said at the beginning of 
Paragraph six, he's not going to make excuses. All of these people have to get off of their butts and actually do something. So to, to end slavery, it's not good enough to just not own them. So let's continue. What then remains to be argued? So what's left? God says it's wrong. You're still allowing it to happen. What more do you want from me? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. So let me stop here for a second. Okay, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So what does that mean in terms of this? Okay, so think about this. You can't allow slavery to occur and still be what? You can't allow slavery to occur and still be a good Christian. Who can reason on such proposition? They, can, they that can may. I cannot. The time for such argument is past. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The prosperity of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Okay? So here he goes again, right? He's saying words like... He's saying words like roused. He's saying words like quickened. Okay? He's saying that they need to be startled. Okay? That they need to be exposed. That they need to be proclaimed and denounced. So, what does he want them to do then? This is the part where Frederick Douglass is calling to action. Is ma he's making a call to action, okay? They need to do something. They need to hurry up with it. They need to be quick with it. They need to expose all of the problems. They need to get rid of it. And they need to get rid of it as soon as possible. What? To the American slave is your 4th of July. So now we're going back to the theme of this whole speech. I answer. A day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. Okay? So here it is. Oops. Here it is right in a nutshell. What does it mean when you're having these slaves come to celebrate this holiday with you? Okay? It's right here. It's a gross injustice and cruelty. He does not beat around the bush. Okay? To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. There is not a nation 
on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Darn. Get right to the point. Now, listen to what he says at the end. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair this country. Okay, so he's saying he doesn't think that this is it. He thinks that change can happen. He hasn't lost faith yet. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. Ha ha! The arm of the Lord is not shortened. Whoa! Hello! Now he's quoting directly from the Bible. That's how, remember, like that's part of his MO. That's part of what he uses. And the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. So he is ending this whole speech with hope. He has hope to end slavery. He has hope to unify the country. He has hope in the Declaration of Independence, okay? And he has hope in the people within the United States, okay? So he leaves off with this really powerful message that even after all of this, he still has hope.